All right, so the Business Diversity Center would like to welcome back Sol and Jai for a second interview as part of our Faculty Spotlight Series. Uh, Sol recently came back from an extended trip to the Gambia, and we'd like to kind of um, ask him some questions about his research there dealing with microfinance. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, so for our first question, um, you spent several months in the Gambia researching microfinance effectiveness. Mm -hmm. First, can you please remind us of the definition of microfinance, um, and then can you tell us some of your main takeaways from your research in the Gambia? Right. I mean, there are many definitions of microfinance, but uh, I'm just uh, going to give you a brief synopsis of basically what microfinance is. So uh, microfinance is basically giving out loans, technically to people who don't have collateral, right? It's basically giving loans without collateral. That's basically the definition of microfinance, right? Uh, and it was started by Muhammad Yunus uh, in, uh, in the 70s. Uh, he was a professor in Tennessee, and then his country, Bangladesh, gained their independence from uh, Pakistan, and then he decided to go back and actually set up a microfinance initiative. And since then, it's been targeted, uh, the target population is basically the demographic, so to speak. It's mostly women, but it's mostly the unbankable, right? Uh, it's people who don't have access to capital, right? So it's actually given the definition of micro, which is small, basically. Small loans to people who don't have access to capital, so to speak. And my main takeaway in the Gambia vis-a-vis -vis microfinance is that, main takeaways rather, because um, the prism of my research has a lot to do with neoliberalism. And there are many arguments that microfinance itself is a neoliberal initiative, right? It has a lot of neoliberal traits, that's true. However, when I went to Gambia, I learned that there were microfinance initiatives in Gambia well before there was neoliberalism, right? And most of the microfinance initiatives in Gambia, especially the rural microfinance, are actually based off of that. They are built upon the principles of small loans that women were doing well before there was organized capital in the Gambia. And uh, they call them the Osusus in the Gambia. Basically, it's been there for over 100 years. Women have been doing it for a long time. The only problem uh, is that they were not that well organized to where they could actually save and actually help their daughters and their sons and their family, health care and whatnot. Basically, it was just for consumption purposes. Now, with the emergence of microfinance, it actually changed the dynamics a little bit because it's more organized, it's more structured, where people can actually save now before. So I think my main takeaway is that microfinance in and of itself in the Gambia is very different from many, let's say, in Bangladesh. And another thing also I found out is, as social scientists or political economists, we don't usually look at social resilience. I don't know why we don't, but I think it's crucial. One thing I found out, I met some people in rural Gambia who don't have access, basically, to capital. They go like a day or so without food. You ask them why, how do they even do it? And the question is, they just hit you with the profound God. Like, God is the reason why. Most of us are not that religious, right? And uh, when people give us that answer, it's perplexing. However, it's fascinating that the only reason why these people are actually going days or so without food and actually having the resilience is because they have faith in God. I actually wrote an article about it right after I came back, and it blew my mind because I didn't know that people would actually keep on praying to the same God. And that God is not even giving them the answers, yeah, yeah. right? However, if you take that away from them, you're basically taking away their hope. Because faith gives hope. And hope gives optimism, right? And that's the beauty of what I found there. Because one dollar is about 45 in the Gambian dollars, in the Gambian currency. That would buy you a lot of stuff, right? So people who were having access to only $2 a day, who were living only $2 a day, are now actually living, you know, they actually have, you know, living like 5 $6 a day. They can actually provide certain things to their family and whatnot, right? So I think that's a huge success when it comes to microfinance in the economy. And it's also creating a lot of entrepreneurs. It's creating a lot of entrepreneurs, especially among rural women. You have a lot of women who, before microfinance, they're... They keep off basically their sales and the buying and selling what they were doing in the market was basically for consumption. Basically for consumption. Now they can actually save. That's a success. That's a huge success, right? They actually now have a rainy day fund, right? They can save and buy and sell stuff 
instead of taking just loans all the time. Now they will take loans. By the time that loan even graduate, before they even pay the loan, they have enough money to go and buy again, buy a couple of times within six months, which is fascinating. So I think those are success stories that need to be told. I think the biggest problem, especially with the nonprofit, that's why I'm focusing both nonprofit microfinance and commercial microfinance. I'm looking at both. The nonprofit microfinance, the problem is that the people who were running these initiatives in these villages, so what they did when they came, there's this, uh, the microfinance is mostly under the prism of the Central Bank of the Ghana, and it's called the Visaka Initiative. And the Visaka is in tandem with the United Nations Development Fund, UNDP, and IFAD as well, International Food uh, Agricultural Development and whatnot. So when they started these initiatives in the Gambia, they go to these villages and take one of the kids in the villages, maybe who graduated ninth grade from some high school, I mean from middle school or something, without any training and whatnot, and make them oversee these programs in these villages because they want to make sure that the people who are running it are from the villages, right? But these people lack the training. They lack the know-how, how to run microfinance initiatives in the Gambia. And all of those things are failed. Most of the non-profit microfinance has failed in the Gambia. They have failed. And another problem with, um, with the microfinance is that you're dealing with a very illiterate population, especially the rural villages. You're, you're dealing with a lot of illiterates. You basically have to teach them how to manage finances. And the non-profit microfinance didn't do that initially. They did not. They didn't do that. And I think that was a huge, huge problem. Because they didn't explain to them about, they didn't explain to them how profits work, how revenues work, right? What interests are. These people don't understand those concepts, right? Because you're dealing with a population that they were not even interested in borrowing to begin with. Because for them, debt is basically servitude. People don't have debt. They buy stuff right away. If they don't have it, they just suck it up, <laughs> right? That's what they did. So now you're giving them loans. For them, loans are a big deal. They're a big deal. But the nonprofit, they don't look at it as loans, though. That's the problem. They look at the nonprofit more as a, um, they look at it as grants. You know, oh, it's international development. You just take it for granted. They don't pay it back. The people who were supposed to over, uh, oversee the, the initiatives, those are the, mostly the people in the rural, I mean, the, the kids from high school or middle school or something without any training whatsoever, they bankrupted these microfinance initiatives. Those things haven't worked. So that's why non microfinance, um, the commercial aspect, came into play. And they're having huge successes in the government. And the government actually, under the central bank, is actually now barring, basically, having this clause where they're actually deregulations and whatnot, preventing a lot of non-profit microfinance from operating in the Gambia. Now they can actually only be subsidiaries in the Gambia. So there are only few non-profit microfinance left in the Gambia. The majority, they can only, the only way they can operate is to be subsidiaries, basically to give loans out to the uh, commercial microfinance initiatives so that they will basically run the programs in the Gambia. So Gambia is really fascinating because in every village, and the, what they're looking at in the, in the villages, in the rural areas, 100% of their borrowers are women in the rural areas. So what they do, they go to these villages, and most of the villages have something called, they, they call kafo in the local Gambian dialect. It's called kafo. And the kafos are basically a group of women who just band together. Or they have their microfinance initiative called the Ususus that are totally different from the organized microfinance. They have been putting money together for generations, right, to help each other out and whatnot. So what, what these microfinance initiatives do, and all these women are already involved in entrepreneurial, you know, something buying and selling, because that's the only means of survival, right, apart from agriculture. But most of the men do the agriculture. The women, not so much. But um, mostly what they do is just buying and selling. So what this microfinance, do, what my, uh, commercial microfinance does is it comes to these villages, talk to them, because they already, they already have their groups, and explain to them the benefits of actually having a microfinance initiative where they can actually have access to capital. So once they have access to capital, they tell them this, this is the way you should do it, basically, right? They give them the training, okay, every month you have to pay this in interest, every month you have to pay this in profit, every month you have to basically have this kind of revenue, right? So they're more structured and they have books where they're writing what they keep of the money and whatnot. So what it does, 
I think the beauty of it is that you have people who started basically borrowing about borrowing about let's say fifty dollars to now they're borrowing about two thousand dollars. They started from small scale the micro enterprises. Some of them have already graduated, they're selling in the market, right? They actually expanded their businesses, right? And I think that's one of the beauties of the microfinance initiative. And the products they offer them is that you can start from here, but the more you save money and the more you pay into the system, the more money we give you. So you have people who have started, let's say, just like I said, $50, they are $2,000, $3,000 now, right? They actually they expanded their businesses. They started with little canteens on the street corner. Now they have their own shops, right? So I think that's one of the beauties of, and most of these women are involved in different, different initiatives. Not in sometimes, sometimes you face a problem where you have a village that doesn't have a lot of commerce. So the market is very, it's not dynamic, right? They're selling pretty much the same things. So what did, what the commercial microfinance does, it basically explains to these people how to expand their business, how to diversify the market, right? So that they won't be competing for the same customers. And I think that's another thing, another beauty of, you know, the commercial microfinance. It has its down, downsides, especially with the interest and stuff. And some of the women don't understand these concepts, but they try to explain these things to them. And they hire professionals to actually do these things, right? Rather than the nonprofit where you just pick another kid, any kid from the village and basically, you know, give them the access to actually become loan officers, right? Without even training them. Whereas the profit, non, whereas the profit microfinance is for profit, right? It's commercial. They're there to make capital, to make money, right? So what they do basically, they train them, make them into entrepreneurs, but it's based on the Osusu model. It's the models they have. They actually set up their own rules, their own regulations, so to speak. They have their own committees. They, every group actually appoints their own president. They, what I find really fascinating is that every group has a name. They just pick up a name. So some villages, you, you go there and uh, you have people who actually, some of the village, I mean, some of the groups are called Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. You know, Tecito. Tecito basically means um, commitment, so to speak, right? But it's really fascinating the names they come up with. And I asked them, why Warren Buffett? Why Bill Gates? They said, well, they want to be like Bill Gates one day, right? That in and of itself is fascinating. That women in this village actually know who Bill Gates is, right? So yeah, I think those are really interesting things that um, you know are worth noting. I think financial literacy should be number one. I think um, that's one of the things that they don't put a lot of emphasis on. Even though the for-profit microfinance is trying to do that, I feel like that's something they need to do. The they need to really, really focus on financial literacy. And they also need to expand the loans. I think the loans are too small to move people out of poverty, right? Um, I think the scheme is great. It's a good way to move people out of abject poverty. But with small loans, um, it's basically, some people are just gonna use it for consumption purposes. They're not gonna move out of poverty. And the whole idea of microfinance is actually moving people out of poverty into the middle class. Right, so if you don't give them enough capital, it's really going to be hard for. And most of these women, that's what they tell you: we need more money. It's not enough because they're expanding their business, but to what level, right? Because these women want to expand; they want to go and sell in the cities and all the stuff. They want to expand their market and whatnot. And with the small loans, that's not going to cut it for them. For most of them, they 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 have that problem, right? So I think financial literacy is important, but. Also expanding the economic base, basically giving them more capital, I think that'll be crucial. What the commercial market finance initiatives are doing is a good thing. The financial literacy, I think that's good. But the other thing is that I think you create human capital. You have to create human capital, right? Even though some said biological has something to do with human capital, but I feel like human capital you create it, and I feel like there are a lot of opportunities for the government to actually invest in education. And the way they're investing in education, I don't think is the right way. They're warehousing students basically just from middle school, high school to the twelfth grade, with no skills whatsoever. The university has about four hundred students. 
out of those 400 students, you probably half of them are actually law students in a population of 1.5 million. Three murder rates in a year. Three people die. You know, three people are, you know, three people are convicted of murder every year, basically, so to speak, in the whole country. You have a market that's saturated with mostly lawyers, right? Um, they're not investing in the economy in the way they should. And uh, people don't even understand the way the economy works, right? And it's fascinating, but 84% of the government economy is informal. It is in the informal sector. That is huge for any country. And I feel like it's the government's job to actually create some of these things. Yes, they have free education for women in the Gambia, of course. But I feel like the education system is not good enough because you have students in the University of the Gambia who can even construct sentences. That's a problem. That is a huge problem. And I feel like the onus is on the government. However, but I also think the private sector and the citizens themselves should be also be invested in the country. Most Gambians just want to travel. That's it. That the goal of every most Gambian kids, I mean teenagers, you ask them what you want to do. Oh, I want to go to America. I want to go to England. Basically, that's it. I want to go to Europe. They're not going to tell you, well, yeah, I want to stay here and be a lawyer or something. And you cannot blame them because they don't have opportunities. I mean, the government is actually borrowing at over 100% of their GDP. By last summer, the government actually has it's borrowed more money. I mean, it's taken all the money from the central bank to where the central bank can even give loans to the banks. That is outlandish. So the government is not technically spending in human capital the way it should. And I think education should be the number one. For me, in education, when we talk about human capital, because we can talk about social capital, which is also part of human capital or whatever, but I feel like human capital should be the most, the most important thing when it comes to human capital should be education. Whether it's financial literacy for women in microfinance, or it's actually through the secondary, the primary, secondary, or tertiary institutions, basically the government investing in that to create that kind of human capital, right? And I think the capital is there, but it's untapped. Uh, but I think the listening helped me in many ways in that I was able to get answers that if I didn't listen, I wouldn't have gone, right? Because I wasn't pushing people to talk to me. I was basically asking them questions and listening to them explain what they are going through, their problems, their shortcomings, um, the pros and cons of microfinance. And actually, even after my interviews with them, because most of the interviews were with the loan officers, they actually pushed me up you know, pull me on the side and basically explain to me things they were not willing to explain to me in public, right? And I think the listening part was very, very crucial because they knew I was there to listen to their problems, right? Because when I came there, the, the first thing I told them was that I'm here to study microfinance. And I'm not here to study what is only good. I'm also here to study what is bad. I'm also here to study what is working and what is not working and your problems, right? all the problems you all are facing. I'm here to listen. And my goal is to document this and write this and make sure that we find answers to these problems. I'm not here to tell you what you should do with your money. I'm not here to give you any advice. My job is basically to listen to your problems, your triumphs, your shortcomings, the pros and cons, to see how we can make this a viable alternative to poverty alleviation in the Gambia. And most people are willing to listen. Yes, I'm going back to Gambia this summer because I'm doing kind of a longitudinal, longitudinal studies of microfinance in the Gambia and whatnot. And um, instead of making projections from last summer, I want to go back this coming summer to interview the people I interviewed last summer to see where they were, where they are now from where they were last year, right? To s see whether we can launch something from Instead of sitting here making projections, oh yeah, probably they're doing this, probably they're doing that. I'd rather go there and actually interview them again and see where they, you know, the improvements they've made or lack, lack thereof uh, in the last year or so. So yeah, I definitely have plans to work in microfinance for the foreseeable future. When we look at microfinance from political economics, most of, micro, most of economics, let's take polit politics out of it, most of economics, if you look at it, we, we are so immersed in numbers that we don't see many things outside these statistics we're talking about. 
And I feel like going to Gambia and doing both, because okay, so I'm doing a mixed methods, so to speak. So I'm do, using both quantitative and qualitative. But I feel like the qualitative is more important to me now than the quantitative. Before going to the Gambia, I thought the quantitative was more important. Going to the Gambia, I feel like the qualitative is more important because, and this is why. You cannot explain the stories of these people using just numbers. That won't be enough. They're so rich. They're so complex and so profound in so many ways that numbers won't do it any justice. You need to explain this in simple English language, in prose, in ways that people can understand. Numbers alone are not going to justify or actually explain the eccentricity and the complexity of people who are going days or so without food. And I feel like going to Gambia opened my mind to these things. It opened my mind to things I didn't know before, right? So it made my research so rich that I feel like qualitative would do a lot of justice. Even though I'm going to use a lot of quantitative analysis, of course, because it's political economy. But I feel like interviewing them has basically changed my experience, my, hum my experience of human beings and the living of it. Basically, the experience of life and the living of it. It has changed it in so many ways. So yeah, going to Gambia quantitative was the main focus. How I'm going to put this all in state and just, oh, just put it in and get my graphs and, you know, my variances and my control group and all the stuff. But going there, I feel like I need to write this. I absolutely need to narrate these stories because these are stories. They are not only data that we can use for economic development or put it somewhere and get a job at the World Bank or something. I feel like it's much more than that. Their stories need to be told. And to tell these stories, you have to write them.